Well, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to have you here. It's Thanksgiving week, so I know people have uh, lots of other places to be, other uh, other places to go. But it's good to have a turnout for what I think is going to be a discussion about what uh, I think, anyway, is going to be uh, a very important event: the 13th uh, Ministerial Conference coming up in Abu Dhabi. Uh, at the end of February, we're trying to get a jump on everybody by looking at the issue first. We may come back and do that again closer to the event, but we thought this would be a good time to at least start people thinking about it. And, you know, in the immortal phrase from uh, Smoking and the Bandit, we have uh, a long way to go and a short time to get there. So I'm not going to make any extended remarks. I'm going to turn it immediately over to our speakers. Our format is that uh, we have two uh, distinguished keynoters, uh, whom I will introduce in a moment, who are going to make some brief comments. And then Meredith and I will have a, a, a chat with them. Uh, following that, we have a panel of experts. Well, actually, we have two panels of experts, uh, who one after the other, that will each talk about uh, uh, goals for their particular uh, uh, stake in the outcome. Uh, for the ministerial, and so I hope that way we can drill down into some of the substance and, and details. I'm really pleased that we've been able to get such distinguished opening speakers for us, and they are, in the order they're going to appear, Maria Pagan, who is the Deputy United States Trade Representative and our ambassador to the WTO, back here, I assume, for Thanksgiving, but we're delighted that she could do this in person. Uh, prior to that position, she was a Deputy General Counsel at USTR and for a time in the beginning of the Trump administration acting U.S. Trade Representative, which I'm sure was a great joy for her. her. Uh, she's been the lead U.S. Attorney for numerous trade agreement negotiations, including the TPP, the Peru and Colombia Free Trade Agreements, and the revised WTO Agreement on Government Procurement. So she has a lengthy background in uh, very specific negotiations as long, along with a whole bevy of legal issues. Uh, our second keynoter, I'm sure many of you know, if not all of you know, is Susan Schwab, who is currently chair of the National Foreign Trade Council Board of Directors, a superb organization close to my heart, uh, and also a strategic advisor in Mayor Brown's international trade practice. Uh, relevant to this discussion, of course, she is uh, formerly uh, USTR in the Bush administration, deputy USTR in the uh, George W. Bush administration, uh, and previously served as the uh, director, uh, the assistant secretary, directing the U.S. Foreign and Commercial Service in the previous Bush administration back in the late 80s. Sue and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, she got her, uh, not her, ex professional start, but her political start working for John Danforth, the senator from Missouri, who went on to trade the, chair the trade subcommittee in the Senate, while I was working for John Hines, the senator for Pennsylvania, and we found ourselves most of the time teaming up, working in tandem to accomplish objectives that were important to our states, and on an occasion, not always working in tandem, but sometimes on opposite sides. Uh, but it's a delight to have, uh, have her here. It's always a delight. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Maria uh, for some comments, and then we'll have the discussion. Meredith will introduce our panels when uh, this part is done. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, particularly with Ambassador Schwab. It was a pleasure uh, working with and for her um, when she was a USTR. Um, I guess I, I would just um, start by laying out um, the lay of the land on the road to MC13, which is fast uh, approaching. You know, from, from my perspective, uh, this is the way that I think about all the work that we have um, ahead of us. I'm going to start with the boring stuff, and then I'll move on to the stuff that you want to hear. So bear with me just a little bit. Uh, but I do think it is important um, because we are involved in everything um, at the WTO, and it goes from the very smallest things to very big, important things. Um, a lot of the agenda for MC13 was laid out at MC12, um, and we have been very active on a variety of work streams that we agreed um, to pursue um, at the MC12 um, uh, ministerial. So for example, e-commerce work program, uh, we have been uh, have, um, actively contributing to the reinvigoration of the work program. Um, it really has been great. There's been a lot of energy behind it. 
and we have successfully completed a series of substantive discussions, particularly on interest to developing country members. And of course, if you follow e-commerce issues and the e-commerce moratorium, you know, the dynamic with a lot of the developing countries is really important. So, and that group has done a lot of good work, will continue to meet um, until uh, the ministerial. A little bit of work that has gone under the radar, but we're very proud of, is the SPS work program. Uh, which was something that the United States, working with other delegations, but really the team uh, in Geneva did a lot of the work um, to set up uh, a series of um, working groups or discussion groups, focusing on sharing experiences and discussions on how the S proper implementation of the SPS agreement can help um, farmers, uh, can help everybody, particularly with the challenges of food security um, and, and food availability in the long term. So we've had a lot of good, really good discussions under that, and we hope to see um, maybe some recommendations coming out of that. Something else that was set up that, again, is very important um, and has uh, elicited a lot of work was um, working on the pandemic response. Um, we have been, again, doing a lot of um, uh, experience sharing, a lot of events um, on how trade facilitation can help members be prepared for all sorts of humanitarian crises. It was a focus on the, on the pandemic, but a lot of the work is also, you know, can be used for, for other, um, any kind of humanitarian emergency. And we've, we have hosted some events more focusing on, on humanitarian crisis. This is not some bold trade stuff. Uh, which is not terribly gla glamorous, but it is really why we are at the WTO, and and uh, it gets a little you know little attention, but it's it's truly important. As I'm sure you know, there are a number of LDC proposals, and we always have the whole trade and development conundrum. Um, we are very engaged um, on all these conversations, trying to find the path forward on on how we, from my perspective, get out of this develop developing country divide, and so that we can really help everybody see the value in being at the WTO. Um, just recently, we actually uh, agreed at the General Council on something that we had been working on for two or three years, which is really amazing to me, um, which was a decision on encouraging um, uh, tariff preference granting members um, to take into account the specific circumstances of countries that are graduated from the UN LDC list. And it is one of those things, and maybe we can have a conversation uh, a little bit later, not rocket science, but very important, and just finding the right words to get to yes took almost three years, but we did find the right words to get to yes, and, and, and um, so we've taken already the decision of the General Council. I'm sure it will be presented to ministers. Again, just to, to point out that there is a lot of work going on. It's all you know, nuts and bolts, good work, um, that we should not lose sight of that. Now, going on to the more the things that you're probably more interested in, WTO reform. Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that reform means something different to everybody. Uh, but again, that gives us a lot of space to, to be able to, to do a lot of good work. Um, we also need to recognize that organizational reform and reforming a, you know, the WTO has gotten to be kind of a big bureaucracy. Um, you know, so organizational reform is difficult and it takes time. Um, so we need to take a long-term perspective on that. And to, to me, to us, MC13 is just a way station. It's not the end point. Because one of the key things that we want uh, everybody to acknowledge about reform is that it should be an evergreening process. That we should be constantly looking back and seeing, is what we're doing, are we doing it the right way? Are we addressing the right issues? And, and so that is uh, something very important for us. Um, We've got what we call, you may have heard this term, reform by doing. That's really more at the committee level, um, and all the committees have been very active in just trying to figure out how do they improve their working procedures? How do we make sure that, that you know, uh, we help the smaller delegations participate um, in the meetings in a more effective way? And so there's been a lot of work on that, and I do think that, and, and it should be work that a lot of work that has been done and will continue. And at MC13, I hope that we recognize that work and encourage for that work to continue. Of course, we have the reforming the overall agenda at the WTO. And this part is a little bit more difficult. Um, 
you know, we need to figure out a way of bringing new issues to the WTO um, uh, more quickly and more effectively. But that is difficult. Um, we get stuck in this uh, conversations about whether there's a mandate to talk about this or there's no mandate to talk about this. And, you know, we're trying to all, you know, break out of that. Um, there are a lot of new challenges. There's a lot of desire to work on new things. We do set up, you know, conversations that are just informal conversations or we have plurilaterals, and of course we have challenges with some members with respect to that. Um, so again, we are, this is an area where we're, we're trying to figure out how do we set ourselves up to more effectively be able to deal with the newer issues. Um, so work in progress. To me, also the more, more important and also incredibly difficult issue is to reform how we engage with each other. Uh, and, and I do think that this is probably the hardest because old habits die hard. But in, I recognize that you know to have a successful ministerial, everybody needs to see their interests taken care of. But if we all want everything that we each want, and not and I don't, and what I want is what you know, not what you want, then you know you get into gridlock. Um, and there's. We've had, been having a lot of conversations about what some are calling responsible consensus. Um, you know, it's the ability to say yes to something that maybe I don't care that much about, but it doesn't hurt me, and I'm not going to hold it uh, back as a chit, um, you know, until I get, you know, what I want. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of those conversations that are going on, and, and I think you know, this is something that we should recognize, we should all recognize at the WTO that we need to do, but it is difficult because of course we all, you know, go to the WTO with our instructions. Um, but I am, I am hopeful. So moving on to more substantive, of course, fisheries negotiations. We, we um, did finish uh, fish one, as we call it, uh, at MC12. Uh, we're very happy that we were um, one of the first uh, members to ratify. There's been a lot of good energy behind uh, getting the agreement uh, to enter into force. Um, I think we are still shy of about 60 members for MC13, but there really is a lot of good energy, and I give credit to uh, the Director General for, for pushing everybody. I'm very happy that she doesn't have to push me anymore because we got it done. But it does, to me, it does show that, that there is value, uh, that people see value in, in being at the WTO and, and, and doing these agreements. So now we are in the second phase of negotiations um, uh, uh, for that agreement. No surprise, and if you looked at Inside US Trade today, had an article saying how difficult it is. Well, of course it's difficult. It was the part that co got cut off so we could finish the agreement uh, last year. Um, you know, these are difficult conversations. Um, I try to be half glass full, and I think that, you know, again, because it's a s much smaller agenda, uh, than we than we had uh, going into MC12, um, you know. I hope that we can get somewhere. The difficulty there is we spend a lot of time talking about flexibilities and not enough time talking about what the actual substantive obligation is going to be or who's actually going to have anything, uh, any obligation. And we don't want to agree to something that is basically going to bless bad practices and sustainable practices into the future. Uh, just just to get an agreement. Um, one of the key issues uh, continues to be transparency. We need more transparency. One of the issions that get, that, that in which we get held up is the lack of data of what's happening out there with these programs. And so I hope that you know, we will continue to, we certainly will continue putting a focus on transparency um, because we do need transparency in, all, in order to be able to understand what is happening and of course, um, we will continue to push um, our proposal on transparency with respect to forced labor in fishing vessels. It is an important issue. It's well documented. And, um, you know, we will just continue to pursue that. We think that there is space for the WTO to do something on this issue. Um, E-commerce moratorium. Um, again, we've done a lot of good work on the work program. Um, we've put a lot of effort into it. Um, in particular, as it, as it relates to the benefits to small and medium enterprises and small and medium countries. So we support extension of the moratorium, particularly because of this, the value that it holds for small and medium companies and, and countries. There is a lot of support uh, for extension of the moratorium, including among developing countries, 
but all it takes is one or two uh, to say no. And I, if you are following this issue, I'm sure you are aware, um, you know, of, of those who still. It doesn't matter how, you know, wonderful work program conversations we have. You know, the decision as to whether they support it or not is based on other things and not necessarily, you know, uh, the evidence that we put forward. So. Um, I'm going to actually go into agriculture before I go to the one that you're waiting me to talk about. And actually, in agriculture, because I think we'll probably have a little bit more of a conversation about that, um, negotiations have been going on for 20 plus years. We are very, very, very stuck. Um, you know, for a long time, we have been saying, with the United States have been saying, we need a reset on those negotiations. And it's certainly clear, I mean, I've only been in Geneva for, since March of last year, and I can tell you exactly what each delegation is going to say in the meetings. I'm sure they can, they can say the same thing about, about me, about us. But uh, we do need a reset, and it does seem to me that the path forward is to acknowledge that all the variables need to be on the table at the same time. Putting one thing in front of another is not going to work because all these issues are very related. Um, so, again, there's a lot of effort being put into it. Uh, the chair of the uh, special session is trying to get uh, members to be creative. Um, so, you know, TBD. And there's this dispute settlement reform. Um, as a reminder, uh, at MC12, we did not collectively agree that we were going to deliver dispute settlement reform by MC13. That said, we are fully committed and we fully support the interest-based conversations uh, that are underway. Uh, they're intended to build a reform dispute settlement system that reflects the interests and the needs of all members. Uh, the process has been very intense, um, and it has also been a very different way of approaching a difficult issue, and I actually wish that um, we would look at other issues in the same way that we have been looking at dispute settlement reform we have shied away from a here's my text, you know, and then the other, you know, 10 people, you know, delegations put a text on the table and then we have to hash it out. We've tried to start from what are the interests, what is it that you're looking for um, in a dispute settlement system, and then work from that up to then putting things down uh, uh, as text once we have reached kind of a common understanding of what we're trying to do. Uh, so there, there is a lot of good work that has been accomplished. It's been um, mostly on procedural issues, but those are important as well because you know it's a whole system uh, that has to work well. Um, but again, it's no surprise that the more difficult issues are still unresolved. And I just want to be very clear um, that our goal is not to restore the appellate body or to go back to the way things were. Um, we can have a perfectly sound dispute settlement system at the WTO or anywhere else with just one tier. Um, but that said, we are committed to the conversations. We are very engaged in these conversations. And what we want is for others to come with ideas as to how we can you know, meet everybody's interests. So we are very open-minded. Um, and I will, on, on this point, I will finish with that we need to have a little bit of perspective. Um, We've been engaging in this facilitated conversations since only February of this year, and we have made great strides. And I don't know, Stephen, maybe you remember, I don't know how long the DSU review uh, has been going on or had been going on, I think it's an ice, but I would, I would say that we've probably made more progress in this type of conversation than in all those years of DSU review. Um, so, um, anyway, I'm sure there'll be questions about that. Um, just two other things that I'm sure people, at least one people want to hear about. Uh, TRIPS waiver, uh, not technically part of MC13, but of course the timing, you know, uh, makes it part of it. Um, we, I want to publicly thank the USITC for their report. Um, it's been a great um, uh, uh, materials to have in front of us. Um, it's been uh, wonderfully received in Geneva, and um, they, the USITC has made themselves available to do briefings, and so it, I, I think it, it has, and it is contributing to better conversations um, at the WTO and hopefully everywhere else. We um, continue to, to look at the report. 
um, and engage in, in consultations here in DC in particular on this issue. So that's all I have to say on that. Um, I will finish with um, another uh, smaller thing, but I think it's a hopeful, um, you know, uh, another hopeful point to remember. We have, hopefully we'll have two accessions that will be gaveled in at the, at the ministerial, um, two LDCs, Timor-Leste and Comoros. Um, you know, accessions is something that the United States puts a lot of effort um, and work into. And, you know, we're very happy uh, to see that there are countries that still want to join us at the WTO. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Maria, it, it is great to see you. Uh, USTR and the country are very lucky to have you in Geneva. Wonderful to see you again. Uh, great to be at CSIS. I am, I am a fan. Um, lots of friends and colleagues, former colleagues here. Thank you. And um, Ambassador Wolf, friend and longtime friend and mentor. Um, and former boss. So <laughs> wonderful to uh, see you here as well. Uh, I just, I hadn't prepared any remarks, so I've scribbled a few things down. I'm just going to make a couple of points. Uh, and I know we've got some questions we'll get to, and we'll see. I, I'm going to say some things that should be just no brainers, obvious. We cannot forget the importance of trade to the U.S. economy, not just geopolitics. Again, no brainer, but the economy and job creation. Um, again, 95% of the. Uh, <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, I was using this 20 years ago, 30 Long years ago. 95%. Yes, but there are a whole lot of people apparently making policy who don't realize that 95% of the world's consumers are outside our borders. Uh, and we just need to be remembering and reminding others that, yes, in fact, it's out there, including the competitors uh, that are out there. Um, we also need to be remembering and reminding ourselves and reminding others of the importance of the WTO uh, to the United States. No matter how frustrating the WTO can be, WTO negotiations can be, uh, the fact of the matter is it is one of the few uh, multi-country institutions out there where the rules have shown to have worked. It's one of the few multilateral institutions out there today, for example, where Taiwan is still a member along with China. If you had to create it today, or if the U.S. ever walked out the door, um, you can guess who would get pushed out the door shortly thereafter. We need to be remembering uh, things like that. Uh, and a rules-based system is a rules-based system that helps us and uh, has protected us as well. And without those rules, uh, we would be facing a whole lot more economic hostility outside our borders than we even do uh, today. Uh, leadership. Leadership in the global economy today has been lacking. Uh, it is hard to lead from a place of fear and timidity and ambiguity, and we need to be stepping up every day, uh, and particularly in areas that we care about, uh, and articulating U.S. interests. Critically important. And, and I should note that, that there is still bipartisanship in this uh, space. <laughs> Uh, international trade remarkably stayed bipartisan for a very, very long time. Uh, on the pro-trade side of the equation, uh, there has been an upswell of bipartisanship in the anti-trade side of the equation. But I think if you go up to the Hill and conversations that I've had on the Hill on both sides of the aisle, both the House and the Senate, uh, you find that there is a pretty deep understanding, recognition, and appreciation for the importance of international trade and trade rules, rules-based system, uh, and U.S. active engagement in trade uh, that we haven't appreciated or harnessed uh, and some frustration associated with that. If you don't tell the story, if you don't act on the story, 
uh, it dissipates and the fringes uh, take over. We cannot and should not be following models, whether in trade policy or industrial policy. Again, this should be a no-brainer, but I gotta say it anyway. Uh, models out there that are being followed by economies that are growing slower than we are, that don't innovate, or create the way we do, don't generate jobs the way we do, that have more inequality than we do, uh, and that have shown themselves models to be uh, ineffective. Uh, and yet, we tend to look at some of these trade and industrial policy models uh, that um, have clearly bad track records and think somehow we're gonna be able to do them better. Uh, all that said, Remarkably, I'm still a little optimistic because as, as Maria noted, um, and I'm gonna overgeneralize here, if you're in the trade policy, trade negotiating business, you have to be an optimist uh, just to get through your day and get through your week and get through your year. Uh, you have to be optimistic that you can accomplish something that is good for uh, American farmers and workers and creators, businesses, uh, the economy, uh, and consumers, by the way. Uh, and going back to the note about bipartisanship, I think we have underestimated the extent to which uh, we have the capacity to move ahead uh, rather than just sort of go with the inertia. Um, closing. You made the comment about responsible consensus <laughs> and the importance of having that at the WTO. I think that's a wonderful turn of phrase, and gosh gee whiz, love to see more of that in Washington. <laughs> okay, Meredith, you want to go with the first question? Oh, okay. Use the mic, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think since we're going to we'll kind of get into some of the meatier issues here, uh, bring us up to date on fish, Maria, in terms of where uh, the U.S. and the EU and China are all subsidizers and how are you not to the same degree <laughs> <laughs> are you are you looking at limiting our subsidies this is on. Yeah. Um, well again with the, the phase that we're in now is about subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing um, I'm not going to make a categorical statement about our subsidies, but I don't think they contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. We did the, the you know, other uh, prohibitions in the earlier part. Um, and I th again, I think that, you know, what we want is that if you're going to subsidize, there, you can subsidize for good purposes and you can subsidize, you know, for, um, to, con to contribute to sustainability. Um, and that's what we're getting held up. And I think part of it is, because again, we don't have that much transparency on what uh, a lot of members are doing in this area. And so, you know, sometimes you get into this issue, well, why is it that you're trying to protect? Because if you don't have programs that you're, we all should be notifying our subsidies programs, uh, we do, um, you know, then what is it that you're trying to protect? And again, this is where we end up having a lot of conversations about all the different flexibilities that developing countries need. Um, and spending just a little bit of time on what the actual discipline is going to be. And this is one area where, you know, if you throw all developing countries, as you all know, in the WTO, you raise your hand, unless you're the United States and a few others, you just raise your hand and you say you're a developing country and you're a developing country. Um, but there's a wide range of developing countries and some of the biggest subsidizers and uh, the biggest catchers, I forget the ones with the biggest uh, capacity to catch fish, are developing countries. So, you know, you can't, you know, we may be willing to give flexibilities for those who deserve it, 
but you can't have flexibilities for everybody just in the fact that there are sort of proclaimed developing countries, and that's where the conversation, you know, sort of goes around in circles. Um, and again, transparency is, is a huge thing, and we are transparent. Um, you know, other members are transparent, but we need to see a lot more commitment to transparency. And, you know, if members have ideas as, as to what they want to do in the future, if they don't have programs now, then they need to be transparent about that as well. Did you have thoughts? I, I would just say that having fought the good fight on fisheries subsidies and failed to deliver when I was USTR, I was very <laughs> pleased that something at least was accomplished. Um, we all wish it could have been more. Again, going back to the importance of the WTO, um, here's an area where the WTO really can make a difference. Uh, we need to remember principles such as transparency are critically important and, uh, you know, keep going. Let me, uh, can't tell if this is on or off. Is it on now? No. Someone else has control over it. Oh, all right, well, yeah. anyway. Uh, this is really a question for both of you, but um, let's start with Maria on this one, on, that is on, uh, on digital trade issues. The administration has, uh, and I don't, uh, uh, I didn't hear you talking a lot about that in your <laughs> remarks, uh, so maybe we'll put you on the spot here, but the administration has announced kind of a, a pullback of previous uh, long-standing positions on digital trade in the e-commerce joint statement initiative issue. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit and tell us where you think that's going to go? and the extent to which this is going to uh, be an issue in the ministerial. Uh, and then I'm gonna ask Ambassador Schwab to comment on what Maria says. Um, well, the, is it gonna be an issue in the ministerial? You know, probably not. Um, so that's not entirely in my control. Um, the digital issues are in the JSI on e-commerce. Um, which is a plurilateral arrangement, so not all members are participating. And as I'm sure you're aware, uh, there are some quite vocal uh, members of the WTO who don't believe that we should be having those conversations even as a plurilateral uh, negotiation at all. Um, so uh, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to have that conversation at MC13 um, because we're going to get into those, uh, you know, uh, conversations and I don't see how that's helpful. Um, I, I really don't want to uh, get too much into the weeds, but just to reflect that, um, you know, what we did, the JSI on e-commerce had been going on for quite a while. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, in the IPEF negotiations, we um, were taking a different tack on, on digital issues, um, taking time to rethink um, how we need to address uh, this issue. Some of them are, I mean, just, you know, there's a lot of things happening, AI, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening that, you know, is making us take a step back to rethink whether the rules that we have had are the rules that we need to continue to have. So all we did in the, in a way, in the WTO was match the pause uh, that we're having in this other space because it doesn't make sense to have a pause in one space and then continue. And again, these were positions that were taken um, quite a long time ago. Um, and, and that's where we are on that. I'll stop there. I sort of don't know how to begin. Um, that we should find ourselves making decisions that put us in the company of countries that actively restrict innovation and cross-border trade in things digital, uh, force data localization, uh, basically force technology transfer, uh, want to tax uh, digital trade that is facilitating small and medium-sized businesses in small countries uh, entrance into the global economy and economic growth and development. It, 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 is, it boggles the mind that, that a negotiation with such low expectations as the trade pillar 
in IPEF should fail over the U.S. stepping back on something where we were in the lead. Um, the shoot yourself in the foot approach to trade negotiating is just, uh, let me censor myself here. Um, it just strikes me that if we can't lead in areas where we are leaders, uh, that we're losing a good bet here. And this is a space where, this is not just e-commerce, this is digital trade. 20% uh, of US exports, 60% of US services exports. Anyone who's familiar with manufacturing and US manufacturing exports these days, even agricultural, in the agricultural space, but just manufacturing knows that the digital services component of that is absolutely critical. And if we are going to step back and let others tie their hands and tie our hands and miss a chance to reinforce or create rules of the road, uh, it is a totally, at best, it is a wasted opportunity. So I, I'm very sad about uh, the positions that the U.S. has taken. Uh, and again, you can't, you can't lead by going off in the corner and contemplating your navel. Uh, so it, it is critical that we remember where the competition is, and the competition is not just within the United States, it is global, and you're either out there competing and you're thinking about your comparative advantage, uh, or you're waiting until you get run over. So sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. <laughs> and we shouldn't be the bug in this one. Yeah, I mean, Rhea, I think that the concern I, that the business community is still trying to get its head around is that we really had an agreed middle of the road position on a lot of these digital trade issues that have been in effect for a long time, most recently passed in, in USMCA. And to rip the rug out from everyone, your, our negotiating partners in the WTO, the business community, the Hill, everyone that thinks we're going down a path on certain objectives, to respond to one extreme of, of one, one party is hard it's, 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 I think it's a historical deviation from how trade policy has been done in the past. So, so I would, if I could just say here, and this is not directed at Maria, and everybody should understand this. Right. Um, this is an example where we have intense bipartisanship uh, in support of the very items that the administration stepped back from. Right, USMCA, massive bipartisan support. But even before that, I mean, whether we're talking about the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, uh, you got a handful of individuals who see the world a very, rather differently, shall we say, kindly, I'm saying, uh, from the rest of us or who, who are more lawyers than they are economic or business people and really don't care about workers because they clearly don't care about the employers of those workers um, and are willing to sort of kick it to the side um, at the expense of the economy, leadership, geopolitics, geopolitical leadership, uh, and, and the bipartisan support that is behind it. So you're being much nicer than I'm being, but that's, I think I probably feel more strongly about it. Let me uh, not exactly pursue that, but bring in another kind of complicated issue. Maria, you <laughs> several times referred to other countries that are, uh, have been difficult in the WTO. You were very polite and didn't mention anybody in, spe in specific. Uh, I will. Uh, India and South Africa have been the primary two for a long time. And I'm going to ask both of you to, to, to comment on whether anything's changed uh, for, for Sue, whether anything's changed for the ministerials that you were involved in 
uh, with respect to uh, problem countries. And, uh, and ask you both the, uh, the other question of, uh, we are now in a situation where the U.S. has lost a few WTO cases. I mean, we've lost some over the years. But we have, um, in addition to the steel tariffs, in addition to the China tariffs all left over from the last administration, we now have um, subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act that may end up being actionable. We'll have to wait and see if anybody complains. We have Buy America requirements and procurement uh, restrictions in the same act uh, that uh, other countries have complained about. We'll see if they actually do anything. Is our, I guess the question is, um, is our moral authority, if we ever had any, eroding? And are we making it easier for countries like India and South Africa to take a very different line and object to uh, the things that we want to accomplish? Who wants to go Do first? I, I'll, I'll go first. I, I'll go first. Um, I think there's a big difference here. And, and I, I, will, I will tell you why I think that. Um, one of the things about the WTO that's critically important is that countries retain their sovereignty to do, quite frankly, whatever they want to do. Whatever they believe to be in their interest, they can do as members of the WTO. Period. Full stop. End of discussion. Now, when that is in contravention or when that violates the WTO rule, there may be a price to pay, an economic price to pay. But if you're willing to pay that price, you can go ahead and violate your commitments under the WTO. And I happen to think that, that it is absolutely critical that we do every day, day in, day out, everything we can to enforce the rules and enforce, go after countries that are violating those rules. And I think one of the areas where we have fallen short over a couple administrations is not being more active in taking countries to the WTO when they are violating the rules. But there is a difference between, and I, I may disagree with some of the thing, policies that we've undertaken that have been ruled to be um, inconsistent with the WTO. Uh, those, I may disagree with those policies, and I will tell you I do disagree with some of the appellate body uh, ruling. So let's set, let's set that category, set aside the appellate body issue. The difference though is the U.S. doesn't stand in the way of everybody else moving forward at the WTO and making progress on rules. I'm unhappy that we're stepping back and we're not taking a leadership role there. But what other members of the WTO, such as India, such as South Africa have done, is when you have a very broad and deep consensus of the WTO to accomplish forward movement in certain areas, you know, create rules in certain areas where there's a lot of consensus. They stand in the way of that consensus. And, and so that's a, that is very different than, than individual countries such as the U.S saying, you know, we need to do this for our own sake, and um, sometimes we'll change our policies to accommodate uh, a WTO ruling, and sometimes we won't, because we're just not going to. And we'll, you know, face the consequences. That's it. I mean, I think I agree with everything that Susan said. Um, you know, you would have to ask others if they think that we have lost the moral leadership, but um, we need the rules because not everybody's a goody two-shoes. Um, and again, there are sometimes important steps that governments need to take. Um, it's all, you're always going to be balancing uh, different um, equities uh, in your domestic system, and sometimes some other equities are more important than others, like, for example, in transition to a green economy and, the clan, and dealing with climate change. And we recognize um, that if others think that we have done something wrong, they can take us to the dispute settlement, and if we lose, there are consequences. And that's the system that was set up. And, and so, but, you know, and I, I love that you started with the point of sovereignty because 
when I get very geeky uh, from you see my, my former uh, uh, Deputy General Counsel and, and for many years staff attorney at USDR um, hat on, one of the things that I always remind people is, or that I tell people is, you know, look at the Uruguay Brand Agreements Act, Statement of Administrative Action, it doesn't get more geeky than that. <laughs> and one of the very first things that you will see in that Statement of Administrative Action is a paragraph about sovereignty because, and this was ingrained to me as a baby lawyer actually at the Commerce Department because I, when I started was a time when NAFTA and, and the WTO, we were having those debates of, you know, do we want to do this? But so very important, yes, we went into it with eyes wide open that yes, we're agreeing to the system of dispute settlement that will have consequences, but we want to be clear it's not in this words, but it's basically the message, that we retain the right to decide what happens at the end of the day. That's our sovereign right. I recognize that if I am found you know, guilty, um, I will suffer consequences if I then don't fix the problem. But I retain the right you know, to make that decision and nobody can take that decision away from, from us. Um, so again, on that point, you know, we're not the only one who gets sued at the WTO, so there's plenty of other scofflaws out there. And that, that is the way the system is set up because inherently, you know, and this is one of the, the, the things that, that I do firmly believe in, is that, you know, trade is, you cannot, there are very, very few things that are just trade issues. Every issue may have a bigger trade component, but also has other policy components to it. And you have to make decisions um, as a government, that's the job of the government, is to make decisions as to, well, what is, you know, what is the path that I need to follow, recognizing that, you know, I may be falling short in one space or another. So. Anyway, that's my answer. So can I, can I just add two things? One, the U.S. can have a very large impact at the WTO and WTO negotiations, but you can't do it by yourself. I mean, it, it, is, a, it is a very large, cumbersome, consensus-based organization. Um, second, tying back to the issue on digital trade, uh, the concerns articulated by opponents to uh, digital, the digital trade provisions that that have have uh, uh, that were effectively stripped, that have been effectively stripped by the administration at this point from the negotiating table, they can be addressed through existing regulations and regulatory processes. Um, uh, even in the context of negotiations and a potential agreement. So again, anyone who's saying that by entering into an agreement at the WTO, you're tying your hands, that is just not accurate. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 anyway, it's just, you can do what you need to do in your national interest. You can regulate in your national interest uh, and you're missing a bet if you're not using your moral authority to move yourself and the rest of the world in a direction of more transparency and a better rules-based system. Yeah, um, at CSIS we've do, been doing some work on just massive amounts of technology regulation that the European Commission is, is formulating. And with U.S. business being fueled by technology and data, uh, there's a lot of concern that, that governments like Europe are going to be driven in ways that will, to regulate in ways that will stifle the ability of U.S. firms to, to prosper and innovate. Um, and we feel that it's important that the raft of the new EU regulations that continues to come out every day stick by these WTO principles, which the EU agreed to, which, if, which are, are tried and true and just very valuable. They have to, these regulations have to be fair, they can't discriminate against U.S. exporters, and they have to be designed as least trade restrictive as possible. And in order to achieve whatever policy objective, we all have our policy objectives, but we have to look at these regulations and, and form them and craft them in, in a rational way that doesn't hurt in our case, U.S. companies. And I think there's a, a big concern that in the tech space, there's some reluctance now at USTR to go after these things. And I just wondered if you had any reaction to that or 
uh, impressions about where we are going, particularly on, on EU tech regulation? I mean, I don't have, you know, a lot to say on that, but I'm glad that you raised the EU because, you know, we're not the only ones who sometimes do things <laughs> that people have objections to. Um, and, and, and I always love when people just fixate on us. Um, you know, I always say, and I've, I've actually had this conversation with EU officials, we're just Americans and we just do things very openly and honestly and bluntly. They, you know, you discriminate, you, you discriminate in just very, you know, sneaky ways. And so it makes it harder for, 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 for the rest to, to figure that out. Um, but again, you know, I think on those issues, you know, we, we have raised issues with the EU and we do look at every issue. Uh, you know, specifically, I, I will say I'm not in the weeds and all the, you know, the various regulations which are very technical, um, but, you know, I do think that we are looking at all this. Thank you. Let me have, ask one more question, then we're going to go to the audience, so if you've got questions, start thinking about them. Uh, this is for Maria. How is China operating these days in the WTO? Um, and how does our relationship with them there play into our overall relationship with China? Um, you know, as we all know, the WTO is a consensus-based organization, so to get anything done, you have to get consensus. Um, uh, I didn't mention them along with India and South Africa. Would you put no, them in the same group? Uh, no, I, let me finish. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all right. Um, uh, no, and what I, you know, where, are, where U.S. interests and Chinese interests coincide, we work together. Um, I have a very good working relationship with my counterpart at the WTO, and we both recognize that as the two largest economies in the world, the two largest contribut contributors to the WTO budget, um, when we can demonstrate that we are working together um, and that we um, share the same interests in a particular issue, it does carry a lot of weight. And so um, I you know, how it, it plays in the overall U.S.-China relationship, I think you would have to ask others, but, um, you know, it, it is uh, where we can work together, we work together. Okay, questions from the audience. We have someone with a microphone here. There's one over there. Please, when you get the microphone, tell us your name and ask, ask a question and not a speech. Hi, my name is Ujwala Pluri. I work for U.S. Customs Office of Green Trade and Sustainability. And my question is regarding sustainability and climate in international trade. More specifically, what steps is WTO taking to hold countries accountable for, for example, poor quality environmental products in the products that they shift, or like forced labor and other such issues around the environment? Um, I assume that's for me. Um, there are a lot of conversations at the WTO on sustainability and, uh, you know, again, in the green uh, evolution and, and, and all that. Um, but uh, these are not easy conversations. And, you know, we are, you know, of course, the United States, you know, very much uh, welcomes having more conversations on these issues. On, um, so, again, but it's, it's one of those issues that is not generally agreed where we, where we end up sometimes in these conversations as to does that issue belong here or does not belong here. Again, we try to continue push, you know, working those issues through like-minded countries, but always with the goal of bringing in more. On the specific issue of forced labor, which of course for the United States is, you know, you know and, and for me as a lawyer, um, uh, you know, it's been around, you know, we've had this prohibition since, since the 1930s. Uh, of course, it belongs in trade. Uh, that is a very difficult issue at the WTO. We have a proposal um, in the fish subsidies negotiation on, on trans and it's just transparency with respect to forced labor practices in fishing vessels. Um, uh, we have some support, but, you know, it, it, it's not overwhelming. But, you know, to, from my perspective, and I think from our perspective, you know, you just have to keep having conversations, right? You got to keep, you know, bringing those issues into the conversation, you know, with the hope that at some point people will understand and, and I, we won't have to explain why this is linked to trade. Let me, let me uh, uh, add a couple of observa observations. One, uh, I think it's really important that the WTO focus on issues that belong in the WTO where the WTO really has a comparative advantage and can make a difference. There are a variety of venues where sustainability uh, uh, is a better fit. However, um, I'll give you a 
two trade agreement examples that I think uh, where the comparative advantage is in the agreement space. So one is at the WTO where we've tried for years to get an environmental goods agreement. Uh, that is, that should have happened years and years ago. I mean, that, that got launched, I think it got launched in our administration at APEC, but it might have been launched before us, uh, might have been launched during, during the Clinton administration. But in any event, the idea being reduce or originally eliminate tariffs on products that um, are going to lower emissions. Ultimately, there was a list of 54 such products, uh, as you obviously know, and it got hung up on a dispute between the EU and China over bicycles. Inexcusable, inexcusable that that has not been closed. And quite frankly, if I had to list something that could and should be delivered as part of, of, part of, the, uh, of a ministerial, that'd be a good candidate. However, let me then turn to plurilaterals and free trade agreements or regional trade agreements. The strongest environmental goods provisions that we have in trade agreements these days are in free trade agreements, bilateral free trade agreements or regional trade agreements where we aren't even a party, where you have enforcement mechanisms on um, logging, uh, anti-logging uh, uh, arrangements. You've got uh, enforcement provisions on CITES. You've got, so, so you have multilateral agreements that are out there related to the environment and endangered species that have no enforcement mechanisms whatsoever. And where we have built them into trade agreements, uh, all of a sudden we have enforcement mechanisms and we're able to enforce them bilaterally and if we had finalized TPP, we would have been able to enforce them uh, on a regional basis. Uh, so it's sort of interesting that, that outside the WTO, we've been able to do that, but now that's come to a screeching halt. Okay, we have time for one more, and then we're gonna have mercy on our uh, panelists, let them leave right there. Dave? Hello, Madam Ambassador. Dave Salmonson with the American Farm Bureau. I want to revisit an issue you all know well. We've all, U.S. agriculture has put it on this issue over the many years in ministerials. I'm sure it'll come up again this time. And that has to do with public stock holding in agriculture. Uh, issue of importance to us. I still hear from our members about world rice trade and impacts on that, which goes back to this issue. So how will the conversation, let's put it this way, how will the conversation this time be different about that issue? <laughs> One of, one of my questions for, for Sue was going to be, how is it different than the, la than the ones that she had dealt with? So maybe the answer is not. Um, I would hope that it's going to be different. I suspect it won't be different. Um, you know, of course, it's an important issue. And, and for those who are not in the world of public stock holding, uh, you should be happy. The United States, of course, doesn't have any problems with uh, countries doing proper public stock holding programs. They can be done. Uh, the issue is those that are market price support. I just want to be clear because I've seen uh, some prior reports and some you know, trade uh, articles saying that the United States doesn't agree with public stock holding and that it's not quite the truth. We just use the shorthands. It is a particular um, uh, you know, difficult, uh, a problematic um, issue as, as I know I don't need to tell you about. Um, so I hope the conversations will be different. I suspect they won't. Um, and it's not an issue that it's just the United States uh, versus um, those countries who are pushing uh, basically to be reprieved from, from continuing to do practices that are, that are um, again, uh, have negative spillovers, uh, not just to us, but to other uh, developing countries. Uh, so there, you know, there are developing countries who are also very much opposed um, uh, to uh, those who are pushing for, for a final solution or permanent solution on, on, on public stock holding. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that and you can regale us with, with tales of PSH conversations past. <laughs> Well, it's one of the reasons the Doha round tanked, as you know. 
um, because we were worried that what has happened would happen. Um, and it really has, I mean, the big difference now is we've got evidence that it really does hurt developing countries. Uh, it really does hurt uh, competitive agricultural producers and it really does hurt developing countries. Um, is that making it, will that make a difference in the negotiations ultimately? Hard to know. Okay, with that, uh, let us thank our two guests. And we'll bring up the, uh, the next panel, which is uh, Joe Glover, Stephen Nazell, and Robert Kahn. Okay, we're lucky we split up our panel. We were going to be one long panel, and I think they didn't trust me for not falling off the edge. Here, so had to split it into. So we're all got enough space to, to exist here. But we're really lucky to have kind of a diversified set of folks that can really tell us what is at stake here uh, for the U.S. and what, what could we gain, what could we lose. Um, Joe Glauber has just come back from Geneva, he's over there two weeks talking to delegations and so forth, so we're, we're lucky to have him uh, here with us the day after. He's a senior research fellow um, at the International Food Policy Research Institute, but we all knew him as chief economist at the Agriculture Department back in 20, 2008 to 2014. Stephen Izzell is uh, our second speaker, and he is president of the Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology Innovation Foundation. And he also leads Global Trade and Innovation Policy Alliance. And my friend, Robert Bob, as we know him, Dahan, is uh, vice president of, hang on one second. You're vice president of Government Affairs and Sustainability, right? And also a lead on the U.S. Agricultural Technical Advisory Committee. So we'll start with jo Joe and go from there. Okay, uh, so let me just give a few points. Um, yeah, so, you know, just looking over the negotiations over the last several years, not a lot of progress in agriculture. I guess that may not be a surprise to many. Uh, certainly since Nairobi, and I think some of that arguably is because the low-hanging fruit out of Doha was pretty much harvested uh, in Bali and, and Nairobi, and so you're left with a lot of tough things to kind of churn through, um, and that seems, one, just to be a, a big uh, stumbling block, so you get back to the same as I'm sure Ambassador can attest the same talking points that I heard, Susan heard, everyone else has heard. Um, yes, since Bali, stock, public stockholding has been probably the number one issue, uh, not an issue, by the way, for us. That was SSM that was the big stumbling block. Public stockholding really arose because market prices got really, really high around the time uh, the last couple of years of the DOA uh, negotiations were going on. And so countries started raising support prices, which got them in trouble because of the, the calculation for market price support. Um, and that's been a big issue. You know, Bali prevented, or presented this sort of peace clause that India took advantage, has taken advantage of, has asked for a permanent solution. I think there's some technical fixes out there. I do think it's a little bit of a gotcha at this point in the sense that the, the, um, you have countries like India that haven't been particularly forthcoming on other issues as well. Um, but, um, you know, if you look at public stockholding, there's two countries in the world that hold most of the stocks, as China and, and India. Um, you know, the smaller countries, uh, LDCs, others, you know, very, very small stocks. So it, it, it really is, 
gets down to sort of that critical thing. The other big issue is domestic support, which I think a lot of people have said, well, gee, uh, we got all these other low-hanging fruit, let's get domestic support. I would argue that low, it's, uh, the, that fruit's a little higher up in the tree and isn't a very easy thing to get, and particularly for, for the U.S. who would look at, at, at um, uh, domestic support may be willing to consider some, some reforms there, but look at it in the context of market access. And I think Mark, that, of course, has not been so much discussed. Um, hopefully we will see at least a work program emerge that will look at all these issues uh, together, which I think would be a lot more a lot more potentially fruitful, at least. Um, I, I, I'll close, the because uh, I know there's be a lot more uh, that come up in the questions, but the other big thing, of course, is the dispute settlement body, and I think um, agriculture has been a huge beneficiary of, of um, you know, the DSB and has taken, you know, even in the midst of all the trade wars, one, two very important cases against China on uh, domestic support and on TRQ administration. And those were, you know, straightforward disputes that were brought uh, at the tail end, I guess, of the Obama administration, but successfully argued, successfully won, and implemented. So all those things are good things and all the more reason to hopefully get something uh, back so that we have a forum for that. Stephen, I'll have you. Well, thanks, Meredith, and to Bill and CIS for the invitation to participate. So in 1998, WTO members agreed to a moratorium on the imposition of customs duties on electronic transmissions, which had to be renewed every two years by uh, WTO members. And I think this is one of the reasons why this WTO ministerial is extremely important, Meredith, especially as we uh, coming off COVID-19, re-architect uh, the global economy, global supply chains for advanced technology industries. And really, the, the moratorium on customs duties has been instrumental to the growth of global digital trade and the global digital economy. In fact, by 2030, the digital economy is expected to contribute 30% of global GDP and employ over 30 million workers in digital industries. Over the next decade, fully 70% of new value created in the global economy is expected to be created through digitally enabled platform businesses. So the WTO customs duty moratorium is very important. Yet. At the same time, it's never been more vulnerable. A growing number of countries, including India, Indonesia, and South Africa, are making noises at the WTO that they would like to um, suspend continuation of the, of the agreement. Indonesia has already gone so far to create an HS harmonized uh, tariff schedule to allow duties on digital inputs, trying to lay the, the foundation and show how serious they are on this. However, in the ITIF view, uh, letting go of the moratorium is both unnecessary and counterproductive, much like the debate we had over the TRIPS-19, uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 TRIPS IPR waiver at the WTO. A wonderful September 2023 from the o report from the OECD found that for 77 out of 106 countries for which data is available, potential foregone revenue would have completely offset by rising, increasing revenue from that GST and digital services, which are born digital. Moreover, they found that applying existing tariffs on digitizable goods to digital services would lead to reductions in imports and exports of low-income countries by 32% and 2.5% respectively. Middle-income countries will lose 6% of their digital imports. So if India and Indonesia ever actually got their way, this would be like the dog catching the car. Um, and I don't think they could possibly do more damage to their economies than having this uh, uh, moratorium be discontinued. If we think of India, uh, in fact, I spent two weeks in India uh, recently uh, because part of the Biden and Modi administration, I said the initiative on critical and emerging technologies on India is to undertake a study of India's readiness to assume a greater role in global semiconductor value chains. Well, the last thing India should want to do is to create a method by which they would have the ability to impose duties on the movement of either semiconductor chip designs or semiconductor fabs in India. It w if India got its way on this, it would destroy their semiconductor ambitions. I can't think of a clearer message India could send the world that it wants to compete in semiconductors by uh, dropping their opposition to expansion of the moratorium uh, and by in, uh, <laughs> joining the information technology agreement too. 
Uh, Maria talked about the JSI uh, initiative. I'll just mention it briefly. Uh, of course, this is the joint statement initiative on e-commerce. Uh, over 80 countries have come together, uh, actually uh, led by Japan, Australia, and Singapore. Uh, that actually largely agree to provisions on a, on a swath of digital trade facilitating provisions, uh, have come to agreement, and even uh, coming close to closing some chapters on things like digital documentation, e-signatures, e-authentication, et cetera. Uh, however, I think the, the recent announcement by the United States that it was pulling uh, back on its support um, uh, for, uh, or essentially no longer supporting provisions that protect cross-border data flows, prohibit forced data localization, or safeguards force code is going to uh, kind of lead to a pause, and I don't think we're going to see much progress at the ministerial on the uh, GSI e-commerce initiative. Last minute, if I could just comment briefly on the COVID-19 TRIPS IPR waiver. Um, as you all know, uh, at the 12th WTO ministerial in June 2022, uh, WTO members uh, uh, essentially endorsed a uh, intellectual property rights waiver for vaccines, allowing WTO members uh, for a period of five years the use of the subject matter of a patent required for the production and supply of COVID-19 vaccines without the consent of the rights holder. A decision on whether the waiver was to also apply to COVID-19 diagnostics and therapeutics was to have been made by December 17th, 2022. On December 6th of last year, stalling for time, the Biden administration through USDR asked the ITC to launch an investigation uh, into the situation, the global availability of COVID-19 diagnostics and therapeutics and the impact of IPR. As Maria said, that report was issued uh, on October 17th, 2023. From what I'm hearing uh, at the WHO Ministerial, we're gonna come to a final decision on whether or not the waiver should be applied to diagnostics and therapeutics as well. Uh, from the ITIF perspective, however, um, we would counsel the administration to uh, 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 not buy into the arguments made by proponents that intellectual property rights fundamentally uh, create a barrier to access. Um, I'll wrap after this. Uh, when we look at the COVID-19 IPR vaccine, we've actually found that not a single country, company, or entity has notified the WTO of any intent to avail itself of the vaccine waivers provisions, uh, reiterating the futility of the initial agreement. Uh, in our view, the waiver has been a colossal waste of global time and resources, and we should no longer continue this trade. Uh, Bob, in terms of fish, you're front and center again at this ministerial. You were front and center at the last ministerial. And, and that may be just a, a reflection on some of the other issues going on and other possibilities that are out there. And you may be uh, the most realistic, the fisheries agreement may be the most realistic potential accomplishment. What do you see as uh, problems on that road to success at, Minister. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here with you, my former colleague at USTR, and see my former boss, Ambassador Schwab, here. Um, we, um, and I should first say that our sector is um, obviously much smaller than um, digital and much smaller than most sectors at the WTO. Well, we do have an interest in this agreement. And I would say actually three things about the agreement. Number one, um, the key point is to hinge the agreement on illegal fishing that leads to overcapacity. Because the, the way to drive the capacity that exists in the sector that's non-economic activity out of the sector and actually to, to reduce illegal fishing um, is to get at the, the root of the problem so that the boat doesn't go out in the first place. And I think, so I commend USTR on the fundamental approach that the staff has taken to negotiate an agreement that gets at illegal fishing um, at, the, at the front end of the process. Um, number two, um, uh, transparency. Um, I think that the word Ambassador Schwab used actually was um, to remove ambiguity, which I think is very important for our sector. The sector I represent is, um, we are spread all over the place. We have an incredibly complex supply chain. My company's uh, import and export to a total of probably 100 company, countries, pardon me. And so having an understanding of what the country's obligations are in the final document is absolutely critical, uh, both from an offensive perspective, if you will, and a defensive perspective. On offense, the, the countries um, where there is a problem need to clean it up. On defense, 
what we don't want to see as a country, as my members who import a fair amount and our country, which relies on imports to a substantial extent to power the domestic market, do not want to see non-tariff barriers spring up in 10 years or 15 years or what have you, arising out of a well-intentioned agreement that ends up with some ambiguity that creates a problem in the text. Um, and so it's vital that that happen as well. The, the, um, the third thing I would say is that the, um, the, the, where, the, where the fish meets the road, if you will, um, the, it's, in, it's imperative that WTO come down in, in terms of what subsidies are prescribed in fish two or if there is a fish three um, to, to make sure that the subsidies that we get at are the ones that are harming and distort market distorting and do not punish legitimate support that our government and others provides to the sector. So the classic example in this space is I have um, a well-managed fishery, but it depends on regular stock assessments from the government in question, the U.S. government or whoever ever else. So in our case, it's National Marine Fishery Service. They have to have the funds, they have to have the vessels, they have to have the resources to do adequate stock surveys so that that fishery is protected and can be managed. If it's not managed correctly, then you get emergencies, you get closures, you get kill switches, essentially, which our government, um, thankfully, um, has been using to a, less, to, to a lesser extent more and more every year. Um, and so the kind of subsidy that you, what we want to do, obviously, is separate the wheat from the chaff, sorry, Dave, um, and make sure that we are not punishing the governments for managing fisheries well by doing things like adequately funding their stock assessments. Um, so that's the fisheries agreement. If I could just make a couple other points that are not tied to that exact agreement, um, building up what I heard earlier, um, our companies are part of a supply chain that I said is the most globally traded animal protein on the planet. Seafood is the principal animal protein for about three billion people um, in the world. And so we care about this agreement, but we care deeply, deeply about the proper functioning of the WTO not in the direct way that many of you do, but in an indirect way as what you might call consumers of WTO work product. Um, and so in my job, in my experience, um, we care very much about the SPS agreement and its proper interpretation and uh, resolution. We care very much about the TBT agreement and its proper interpretation and resolution. Um, we want to see a WTO process that is transparent and fair, um, that gives our companies and the consumers that we serve um, certainty and predictability and the ability to plan out. Um, and so that's very important. So I'm on the consuming end of all this discussion, but I just did want to say that one point. And, and what you see in trade policy, not WTO particularly, but you, what you see in trade policy today, um, this also falls in the category of blindingly obvious, is a lot of policies that whether they're right or wrong are um, create, create di um, disruption in the supply chain, uncertainty for my companies. Um, my companies, for instance, right now do not know whether they will be paying significant substantial tariffs on China sourcing in about a month. And the reason for that is we can't get out far enough in front of the 301 proceeding so that we can um, give our members the information that they need to contract, source, um, and serve their customers. Um, so um, pardon me for the, the post hoc, um, the post fishery subsidies discussion, but I did, I did want to clarify that and make, make clear my agreement with some of the things that came up in the first panel. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and I, you know, it's interesting because you get delve into every sector and there's key rules in the WTO that, that have been helping U.S. interests, U.S. businesses and workers over the years. And we, we tend to uh, gloss over sometimes some of the, the real wins that we've had there. Um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the dispute settlement system. And maybe, Joe, uh, have you respond to what do you think is possible there, maybe not this ministerial, but down the road? And what is your industry counseling USTR to do? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm probably not the person to address the legal issues on uh, or the problems with the DSB. I mean, I think there are 
clearly there are, you know, again, from the narrow confines of agriculture, I think, you know, we've done pretty well. I, mean, you know, I think of just a quick analysis I did of all the cases involving agricultural products that the U.S. took. I think we won something like 85% of the claims that we, we brought. You know, on the flip side, we lost. In the cases that we were the respondent, we lost a lot of those. But it, it just speaks to the high bar, I think, to bring a case to the WTO. And, and I would argue that, you know, they, they probably ruled right. Now, individual things on appellate body rulings and whether or not they overstepped their jurisdiction, those things, I think, need to get worked out, obviously. But to get a functioning system back where we just not see, you know, where we're... I, I mean, I would like to see the U.S. take more cases. I think it was mentioned, I think Susan mentioned the fact that we just haven't taken very many cases over the last couple of uh, administrations, and I think that's a real mistake. I mean, I think that that's, you know, we are seeing cases being taken. Um, yeah, some of them are getting appealed into the void, but, but um, to me, that's really important as far as agriculture is concerned. David uh, Samuelson mentioned the case with India. Well, we should be taking a case against India if, if we feel like those subsidies are distorting, and, um, you know, and right now we're just not doing that. Are all countries responding to this appeal into the void by just ignoring um, what the panel said? Uh, I don't know so much about that. I mean, there's, there are interesting cases. Like China, for example, accepted the panel rulings, you know, that, that were ruled against for the U.S., or that the U.S. took and implemented. We have had issues on implementation, you know, uh, that, that, uh, and, just, and consultations on that. But, um, you know, you, you, you know, the, the case count is down considerably, though. I mean, I think the that's the, the reality, yeah. But, I mean, I think a lot of this is just having a structural of rules that are objectively agreed by both parties with which USTR can go to that country and say, right. uh, you know, we've got a panel decision, can we work this out? You know, oh, yeah, no, I, absolutely. Long yeah. before you get to a, a panel even be informed, I mean, a lot of these cases, uh -huh. at least in the past, have been solved just through consultations, and that's... That's really important, I think. And that obviously doesn't preclude that from doing, you, from doing having those conversations now, but having a, a system in, uh, in place where rules can be enforced, I think it's, it's just really important. Um, Ambassador Tai has asked a lot of the delegations or in different public statements in the WTO to come up with, with ideas on addressing climate change. And um, we've had some of our own, I mean, to, do you all have any sort of overall sense of where the climate debate is going in the WTO and, and what could constructively get done there? I'll, I'll start. Uh, yeah, the, the, the big interest right now, among, particularly among international organizations, probably outside of the WTO, but WTO has been active in this too, is, is this whole notion of repurposing agricultural support. So taking support that is trade distorting and oh by the way correlated with poor environmental outcomes or poor climate outcomes repurposing that support changing it and putting it more into public goods so climate you know uh, greenhouse gas mitigation strategies and things like that i mean i think the the, the problem if i look at say something the debates that, that's going on in the u.s because you know the agricultural department the the in general the biden administration has been pushing you know uh climate outcomes for agricultural support the support is re i mean the, the debate is really let's have this in the in addition to what we're doing currently. So, you know, the rest of the world looks at that as, well, gee, thanks, you really aren't addressing the problems with, that we see that domestic support's causing, and you're just layering all these other supports on top of it, and oh, by the way, we're not really sure that they're not trade distorting at the end of the day. And I think that's, that's where the debate is. Okay. Um, one thing I would add about the, this is a massive topic, but one thing from our little sector, part of the world is, um, we obviously have a group of harvesters in the United States and most of, most of the rest of the world that take very seriously their obligation to the resource. They don't have a job for their grandchildren in a sector that is very much family driven if they don't have the resource in two, three generations. Um, so we take that very seriously. Um, and I was harking back again to what Ambassador Schwab said. Um, 
on this one, we feel very confident that the FAO is the, is the best equipped international organization to look at these issues and the private sector, which is highly organized in this space in the developed world and drives a lot of change in the, um, in the non-developed world in terms of um, harvest operations, sustainability, et cetera. Um, so that doesn't mean that the WTO has no role whatsoever. I wouldn't say it categorically, but what I would say is that um, we do feel fairly good that our, our protein is a highly sustainable, highly environmentally conscious protein as is, and we feel fairly good that the existing international, um, the best international uh, multinational entity equipped to take that on and do better is the FAO in most, in most instances. And indeed, if you look at the fisheries um, agreement from last year, you will see in the footnotes a lot of references to FAO definitions and statistics and things, which to my mind makes the point that FAO is, um, is where it's at when it comes to this. Okay. Steven? I'll give you a, a bank shot answer. And I'll say that ITLF does have a Center for Clean Energy Innovation that has issued some reports on this. Uh, but in my domain, which is information and communications technologies, ICTs, I should point out that the uh, World Economic Forum finds that ICT-enabled technologies can reduce global emissions by up to 15% by 2030, or one-third of the reduction we need by then. How can we get greater global penetration and use of ICTs? Well, one way would be by expanding the Information Technology Agreement, the ITA, which eliminates tariffs on hundreds of ICT goods. Uh, we could expand both the number of countries that are in the ITA, the original ITA from 1996 is to 82 countries, and expansion in 2015 only has 53, so we could expand global participation in the ITA. More significantly, potentially, uh, an initial set of companies and countries have come together to look at what a second expansion of the ITA, an IT3, might look like. And at September 2023, we released a report uh, which found that if we uh, did an ITA3 that brought 400 more products into the tariff eliminating rubric of the, IP, uh, of the ITA, including things like solar cells, lithium ion batteries, uh, smart water heaters, smart sensors, et cetera, uh, that this could actually grow the global economy by, by $750 billion over the next 10 years and help address some of these climate changes. Great, terrific. All right, so we're covering a, an organization that covers the global economy, so we've barely scratched the surface here, but we appreciate you guys giving a flavor of what's going on in your areas. I think I could take one question from the audience if there's anything out there. Um, otherwise, we can uh, go on to the next panel because we have three more uh, panelists here to talk, talk to us. And I just appreciate your time and, and coming up today. Thank you so much. Great. Okay, I think this is like a, a record that we can get all these people that travel internationally all the time to be in the same room in person on, on a trade. So the, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So good. I, I think um, we're just really lucky to have you folks here to kind of talk about how you're looking at the ministerial. Um, Stephen, I think I'm going to start with you in terms of uh, the, the vaccine waiver, where things stand on that, how you're seeing other delegations sort of absorbing the ITC study that, that Susan mentioned? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, when I view the WTO generally, uh, especially uh, the MCs, uh, I always feel like at this point, the big stuff has always been done. I mean, the first ministerial conference, you can't for two years be remaking the trade over and over. I mean, it can't be just massive ambition every two years. That's just not possible. I think people have to move over towards things that are a little 
not as ambitious, but still very important. And it's okay to have a couple things. Sometimes some harvest is gonna be big, sometimes harvest is gonna be small. You don't ignore the small harvests, uh, and this is one of those years. And uh, there are some things that are ready for harvesting, uh, some things that are not. And I don't think the TRIPS expansion waiver discussion is ready. It wasn't part of it, but this, it wasn't part of the original discussion. It does need issues that has to be or wants to be resolved under the Mr. Conference, I think needs a little bit of runway. They need some discussion. Ambassador Schwab mentioned, or it was one of the ambassadors, uh, mentioned that you know at, at MC12, you work your way up into what's gonna be in MC13, same going forward. TRIPS waiver, TRIPS health, uh, you know, in MC12, they had a, a, a they, they forced through a decision. Uh, the ITC report came out. Everybody thought it was going to be some panacea that was going to say one way or another what the U.S. thinks. It doesn't. Um, and to the U.S.'s credit, they made it available immediately. They wouldn't try to hide it. They're just like, look, this is what it is. There are no findings. Uh, there's just some facts, and there's facts for everybody. That means the discussion needs to continue. It's not done yet. Nobody on either side is, you know, definitively going one way or another. It's just not right. Yeah, and then I, I have to back up and introduce you, Stephen, which is, and I apologize for that, but you lead your firm's practice in Geneva, and you were uh, nine years at USTR as a principal attorney on China matters, and then lots of responsibilities in Geneva as well. And we're really lucky to have you here to, to talk about some of this. Um, Eric, I'd like to talk to you next. Give us a sense of uh, the worker-centric perspective on where we are, um, what we need to be thinking about in terms of outcomes. What do you see the stakes for, for the United States at the WTO? Thanks, um, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, so I represent uh, the AFL-CIO on trade policy. Um, and you know it's funny um i i hesitate to say that you know with most wto ministerials we um we don't have high hopes um and but i think that's principally because um labor issues uh, have really not been part of the discussion at the wto um and you know with the exception of more recently with the efforts of ambassador Tai. Um, and, and her team, and, and thank you for that. Um, I, I, I do think um, we do see some greater ambition in this area, and Ambassador Schwab mentioned something I think that's really important. You know, it, is the WTO the right place to, um, you know, to set standards on labor? No, um, but to possibly incorporate standards that the international community has already agreed to in the in the space of the international labor organization and then plug those in to the global trading system um, in the right agreements in the right sectors the right areas right of course wto being consensus based um, you know always going to be a challenge um, ambassador schwab mentioned something else that affects uh, not just uh, the governments but affects the trade union movement that's the north south global divide uh, we've done a ton of work working with this administration the prior administration uh, on forced labor and the u.s is now a global leader in uh in linking access to our valuable market to uh, the efforts of governments and companies to identify and eliminate forced labor from global supply chains. Uh, and you know, I think the, the, I guess our expectation is that on the issue of forced labor, it could be the tip of the spear for labor issues at the WTO. Um, but even a discussion around that, we have to overcome a lot of skepticism from the global south including from unions from the Global South. And I have these conversations uh, in the global trade union movement. Um, and I'll just say that, um, you know, this is a very broad, I mean, this is not, we're not looking for a specific outcome at MC13 uh, on labor, to be clear, outside of the, you know, potentially getting something in the fishery, the fishing agreement. Um, but just as a longer term issue, um, I just, you know, before, prior to this panel, had a chance to check in with Brussels, our, our trade union colleagues there, um, and, and, and London. Um, 
And there's actually a discussion about whether we're going to be at MC13. Um, uh, it's possible we'll have a panel there um, on this very question. Um, again, this is more laying the groundwork for something that, you know, for a conversation that we think is overdue. Uh, and again, the vision is plugging in the, the minimum standards that we've already agreed to at the ILO into the appropriate spots at the WTO. Um, and we call that, you know, our vision is building a social floor uh, beneath global competition. Um, so that's not always, you know, a race to the bottom, which is, a, which is definitely a perspective that, a, you know, an impression a lot of people have in this country and, and other places. So um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll stop there for the moment. I've got other thoughts on, on things that have come up, but leave some time for my fellow panelists. Let me ask you, um, in terms of what, what are these countries in the global south resisting and why? Good, good question. Um, I think the concern, well, there's, I, I think broadly speaking, they're disappointed that the Doha development round, which has been referred to, um, did not, you know, for a lot of reasons, um, not a lot got accomplished. And I think there's disappointment there. And I think that's understandable. So I think, and why I raise that is because they see this as the forced labor issue as, and it's not, they're not, it, as being pushed by the global north. And they're not wrong about that in terms of who's putting it on the agenda, right? I mean, if you look at legislation getting passed, it's, it's the UK, it's the US, it's Australia, um, it's France, it's Germany, it's the EU now in a proposed directive. Um, so I think, you know, there's a bit of hangover from the Doha development round, you know, that I think that they're saying, okay, well now we're gonna spend our time on this issue. And that's, an, that's just another thing the Global North wants to talk about and that, that's fair. But I think when you get into the substance of the issue, then you move past that resistance. Um, because of course, nobody's for forced labor. Everybody realizes that it's a human rights violation and it's a, fair, it's a form of unfair competition for our businesses and our workers. Um, and, and workers and businesses everywhere, you, you, one would hope. So I, I think there's, I think we, we, can, we can push past that. Um, I'm, a, I'm an optimist as well. So, <laughs> um, and, and, and maybe, you know, get movement on, on this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephen, I wanna go back to, to your bailiwick for a minute. How do you think, I know you, you've got a lot of contacts in Geneva from your years there. Do you think other countries are viewing the, the US, the United States as a proponent of success at the MC13? Um, what is our role at the WTO as other countries are viewing us these days? Um, I, I don't think they view the US the way that they used to, I'll just say that. Um, I, I think we still are leaders in some respects, but probably not in others. I remember my old boss, uh, Dave Shark, when we were in Geneva, he always sort of to told me, it's very important to sort of be above board and to just, uh, uh, to always uh, take the moral high ground. And, and uh, for countries, they do understand that when they talk to us, as opposed to talking to the EU, as opposed to talking to India or others, that they're gonna get, they're gonna get truth. And we're going to be able to talk in a way that you know, our yeses mean yes, our noes mean no, uh, and we do have, even if they don't agree with us, they actually understand that we have the best, best intentions of the system in mind. I'm not sure that's the way that people view the U.S. now, um, and uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, I hope we get there. Uh, you know, where we're no longer, we're, we're not being viewed as potentially isolationists, we're not being viewed as potentially just only about reshoring, we're not viewed as just a country that is seeking to, you know, sort of subsidize ourselves and nobody else and nobody gets access. I hope that we will get to a place as before where we, we the WTO needs leadership and the question is who's going to lead and I'd rather be it be us than anyone else. I mean, are there key moves that have been taken in the last two years that, that call into question a little bit the U.S. leadership? Well, there's a lot. Uh, we don't have all that much time, but I mean, I, I think when we're looking at things like, uh, I, you know, sort of agreeing that we do need some form of industrial policy in the U.S., I, you know, we're, we're moving a little bit 
off our, our main objective. When we're looking at, you know, I, I like the idea of a responsible, was a responsible consensus, which I, I'm gonna start to use, um, yes. <laughs> but I think the US has to do that too. I'm not sure everybody agrees that the US is doing that, where the US is saying, hey, you know what? Um, we either, we may, uh, we may not agree with you on this or we don't really care so much about it and we don't really have a dog in this fight but we're going to try to ensure that it helps the system and it helps grow the system. Um, the IRA raises a lot of issues. Uh, you know, subsidizing all of a sudden is a, a thing now. Uh, for us, uh, rule of law, not as important anymore. Uh, just all of that is, I think, it's a little problematic. Yeah, I mean, I think our center of gravity is shifting a bit, and we used to be a lot more clean hands when we went and tried yeah. to debate with China on their policies on industrial subsidies and so forth. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to introduce Alan now, who we are very lucky to have you here. Alan is a former director general, deputy director general of the WTO, and a uh, long distinguished career at USTR and academics and, and someone that we all have looked up to for, for many years. Um, he's just uh, published a book, the Revitalizing the World Trading System uh, by Cambridge University Press and uh, the Financial Times is calling it the definitive guide to the past, present, and possible future of the multilateral system. So it's pretty uh, great praise and it's available, I understand, instantaneously from Kindle. So as soon as you guys leave this audience, you want to go back and read, it's, it's, it's available to you. But Alan thought he would, uh, given his broad perspective on a lot, of, a lot of the things he's experienced and heard here today, may put things in a little bit of, of perspective for the younger people on the Hill and, and so forth that are trying to understand what, what we should expect from the ministerial, what's possible, what's not and what we can call a success. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, sat here and listened to the wisdom of uh, not only the prior panel, but uh, Maria Pagan, who represents us very well in Geneva, and uh, Susan Schwab, who uh, uh, is always amazing. Uh, the, um, the WTO, uh, uh, the headlines are uh, about, say, U.S.-China tariffs or uh, a number of other things that go on in the world, but 75% of world trade still flows under the rules of the WTO, uh, and uh, maybe more than that, but uh, uh, even with a free trade agreement, still the rules of the WTO are what govern. Uh, and it's uh, extremely important to this country. Uh, the uh, the U.S. has not seen the way it was, in part because uh, uh, the president before this one said uh, he thought we'd leave the WTO, and uh, he's saying now the the leading Republican uh, contender, uh, who's likely to be the nominee for the Republican Party, is saying uh, wants to impose 10% tariffs on everybody. Uh, and um, that is unsettling, I think, others, because you look at the polls, as everybody does, I mean, the U.S. election is uh, looked at a little more closely than some others by the members of the WTO, and uh, it is uh, a real question of whether the U.S. is a reliable partner. Uh, that's, it's not helped that uh, if you surveyed the members, they thought steel and aluminum was really a winner under a national security uh, exception. Um, it uh, didn't help that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, tanked the appellate body uh, without offering an alternative, without saying, here's the path forward, uh, and that still rankles in Geneva, I think. The um, uh, there's a lot of good that can come out of the WTO. Uh, Joe Glauber and I co-authored a piece on food security, for example. Uh, uh, there are a lot of areas in which trade is absolutely essential to solve our major problems. They're not a total solution, but uh, in a pandemic, uh, trade has to flow across borders in order to, we didn't have enough masks, we didn't have enough uh, personal protective equipment. 
Others didn't have enough vaccines. Trade is the answer, uh, not, a, not in the short-term investment. It has to be trade. And the WTO still has work to do, in my view, to uh, put into place a, a response mechanism is what will happen in the next pandemic, and what's not there. Uh, food insecurity, uh, climate uh, change is, uh, or uh, severe climate events, are uh, really causing havoc. And uh, trade has to be the solution. And if there, if there is no uh, reform in agriculture, then we're not well, as a, as a world, we're not well set up for meeting future challenges, for having the most efficient production uh, actually called into being. And uh, there was a question earlier on sustainability. Uh, if you, uh, if, if all countries say, well, my way of becoming uh, secure with respect to food is self-sufficiency, and the Chinese have announced that they want to be self-sufficient in grain to a much larger extent. Japan wants to be more self-sufficient. Everybody wants to be more self-sufficient. Uh, that does a lot of damage to land, does a lot of damage to water, does a lot of damage to uh, pollution. Uh, so sustainability is uh, really uh, goes out the window if uh, everybody says, the way we're going to handle uh, our, our food security is we're all going to be self-sufficient. It's actually disastrous. Uh, so, and the fact that, that we can't get things moving in Geneva and agriculture is, is um, uh, which is called for under the agreement on agriculture, uh, is uh, still a major problem. Why do you think that is? What's, what's the holdup in agriculture from your perspective? It's really the most sensitive political area for every country, pretty much. Uh, whether you're a producing country or an importing country, uh, the agricultural community uh, has a lot of political influence for good reason. I mean, we're all dependent upon them for feeding us. So, uh, in fact, some of us are overfed. Um, <laughs> There's we, drugs we, for that. We have to work on that. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the. the there's so much to be done uh, with respect to pandemics, with respect to food security, uh, with respect to getting agriculture uh, back on the agenda. And we talked earlier, what are the missed opportunities now, which is certainly not going to come up in this uh, upcoming ministerial, uh, apparently, environmental goods agreement that uh, Susan uh, Schwab mentioned. Right. Uh, the uh, makes absolutely good sense, and it's not on the agenda. Uh, uh, updating the intellectual, pro the uh, excuse me, the um, information technology agreement. Uh, you know, why in the world aren't we doing that? Uh, we are putting a lot of money into semiconductors. We're putting a lot of money into artificial intelligence, and we're saying, ah, but others can put tariffs on the latest chips and on uh, the latest equipment. The ITA ought to come back uh, and uh, be uh, brought up to date. The pharmaceutical agreement, uh, uh, we have zero tariffs on pharmaceuticals. Uh, China doesn't, India doesn't. Uh, you know, why, why is that uh, out of the question? Uh, this upcoming ministerial, I'll just say one last thing uh, on it, is uh, there seem to be, in many ways, more risks than benefits. Um, but that can change. Uh, Maria has outlined a number of areas where real work is going on, so that can be, that can be changed. But to uh, say um, the moratorium has gone on electronic transmissions, I know the OECD came out with numbers, but uh, no one knows actually how bad it could get in terms of putting tariffs on uh, digital commerce one way or another. Uh, the general agreement on tariffs and trade, uh, general agreement on, tar on uh, trade and services, uh, has some obligations and they're important. But uh, there could be um, uh, an, a free fire zone when it comes to the digital economy. And uh, um, as just been mentioned, uh, there's no case has been made for reducing intellectual property protection. Uh, for uh, therapeutics and uh, 
and um, uh, other other products, diagnostics. Uh, you know, we could have some real negatives that could come out of this uh, this ministerial. Uh, if this ministerial is a failure, uh, life actually goes on. You know, in 2017, everyone in Buenos Aires except me, I think, said, you know, this is a this is a just a horrible result. And what happened? The joint statement initiatives were begun, and actually a way forward was found. So I think uh, I rely on Maria to have uh, great ingenuity to uh, uh, snatch uh, progress from uh, all the forces that would bring about defeat. No one, no trade negotiator walks away from a negotiation that has failed, a meeting that's failed, and gets a lot of credit for it, in fact, even if they have great excuses and reasons why it didn't work. Uh, um, if anything is remembered from the, in a positive sense of the Trump administration, and I know people have to work hard on that, uh, NAFTA was given a firm foundation politically in this country. It was renewed with a very strong support on both sides of the aisle. A lot of it had to do with labor being looked at more closely. Uh, some of it had to do with rules of origin with respect to the China issues. But uh, the fact of the matter is, it's no longer in doubt that NAFTA, the free trade in North America, is preserved. Um, and uh, looking back at this ministerial, looking back at this administration, there'll be a similar look at, uh, okay, what was achieved? And I think one of the detriments is pulling back on um, the three core elements on uh, the um, uh, digital area, uh, on uh, forced uh, server local, local localization and uh, a free flow of data and source code. Uh, uh, I, that has to be recouped somehow uh, because the United States to be a leader has to be, um, take some risks. Um, and I understand the necessity of maintaining a domestic political support, but uh, that's, that's, that just needs some sewing. Right. Alan, in your view, is the U.S. business community committed to keeping the WTO in working order? What can they do to help Maria and, and the USTR team over there? I think that uh, there's a, um, there have to be things that look like they're of commercial value or, or perhaps when there's a threat uh, for the business community to be mobilized. The threat now is loss of the digital um, uh, moratorium, and uh, I think that mobilized the digital community. When I was in Geneva at the WTO, uh, there were uh, very, very, very few visits from the private sector because we weren't doing enough uh, that was of direct commercial interest to them. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, folks would come over for the public forum, but they would not otherwise bother to make the trip. Uh, they'd go to UNCTAD for a meeting on uh, um, the digital uh, space, uh, but they weren't coming to Geneva uh, very often. Uh, some from the agricultural community were, but uh, the only way to have interest is to, uh, and this is partially the fault of the business community, is to say, uh, here are the things we need. Uh, here's, what, here's how we would handle the pandemics in the future. Here's how we would handle food security in the future. Um, uh, here's, here are our, our remaining objectives. The fact is, uh, in most major developed markets, tariffs are already low, and uh, um, the gains are not seen to be there. Um, and, uh, but you know, business services, uh, largely not covered. Uh, you know, so GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, has to be improved. Uh, there's a lot to be done, uh, and um, it would take leadership by the administration, and, but also leadership from the business community. Okay. Do you either have any comments going forward? Sage advice? Well, I'll, I'll, 
I'll just really quickly um, not only repeat that, you know, we don't need ambition. I, I, every time I hear the word ambition now, it's always somebody trying to slow things down or step out. So that word scares me when somebody <laughs> says that. Nobody ever says it for the right reasons anymore. Um, and I think it's important to get the small gains and it's important, I think it, you, you both have said it, not to, not to have somebody just trying to stop everything uh, and using it as a, as a, as, as a reason. I, you have to come somehow just be able to move issues on their own. There, there are objective, common sense solutions to an issue. Stop horse trading. There's not enough stuff out there to horse trade on. And I'd say that that's probably the success for the future MCs really. I mean, you know, maybe 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we'll have another big MC. But right now, let's do the baby steps. Let's sort of rebuild and solidify this organization. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> Along those lines, I, my piece of sage advice for, for the WTO, and I guess this is for the member states as well, is um, I don't think this is a time when it comes to industrial policy uh, with everything that's going on here, the massive, incredibly necessary investments that we're making and through the IRA, through CHIPS, um, which are have a lot of support um, among our public um, and certainly among the labor movement. Um, and if you can look at the, what's happening in the EU, they're making analogous investments, not quite at that scale. Um, and I don't think it's a time for folks to look to pick a fight. Um, and folks mentioned before, maybe there'll be a, you know, a WTO case filed around the IRA. Um, I actually think that would be a disaster for the WTO. Um, if a case is filed and the panel comes out and finds that the IRA or something, that, you know, is not WTO compliant, I can't think of one thing that would put more wind in the sails of Donald Trump and his stated intention to leave the WTO than something like that. Um, I think it's that, that, that is underappreciated in my view. So I, I think, you know, the global trade rules have to find a way to accommodate the, uh, the industrial investments um, that are being made for climate change and for other reasons. Right, and, and I Could just I, want- I just add one, one point, and that is, uh, with respect to dispute settlement, some things can be done that can't be solved in this ministerial, but some things can be done. Uh, no more appeals into the void. Block that, end that. Uh, and if you want to bring a case, you have to be willing to accept a result one way or another. It may be through a, an interim arrangement. It may be through just a bilateral agreement with the, among the litigants. It could be just accepting the panel finding as final. But uh, uh, no more fraud. Uh, the president of Indonesia, when they lost the case on uh, uh, minerals, said, no problem, we're appealing. He understood, it, you, there's nothing there. If you want nothing to be there, there's nothing there. That's got to end. And could there be a down payment on reform? There are some things that were in the Walker principles, the so-called, and uh, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of work has been made that uh, Maria has been in the middle of. Uh, a down payment could be made towards reform, and it would restore a feeling that the U.S. is really there, uh, is very serious about uh, uh, rectifying uh, reforming, making the organization better uh, in a number of areas. This this ministerial could be about down payments, not going to be about final, you know, uh, amazing solutions to uh, 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 all the issues that are out there. Same thing on the digital area. There are some things uh, they might not be the most major in the world, not the most exciting, like e-signature and and open government and whatever but the, a down payment can be made. So progress can be made at this ministerial, and it can be a success in those terms and put in a work program for agriculture, a serious work program. Great, thank you. I will, if there's a, a question in the audience, I can take it, um, but happy to just wrap up here if we're running. Okay, and we've been, you know, just blessed to have Maria here coming in from Geneva. I'm very grateful, and, and Ambassador Schwab, it's a, it's a good team. And, I, and I'm just really glad we had uh, Eric here because of, in, coming from the Hill, we have these bipartisan agreements, consensuses that are passed resoundingly like USMCA. And to see them starting to unravel worries me because I think 
one, you know, one administration unravels one place and another administration can unravel a different place. So I think we're in this democracy, we're all kind of better served by looking at where the, where the consensus is, where the law has passed and been approved by members of Congress. So I think uh, we've heard an awful lot of uh, perspectives on the WTO. My sense as a takeaway would be, let's do the small things that we can do and live to fight another day, push the thing forward. It's not gonna be a failure no matter really what happens. I think it's still, still functioning and operating and addressing some problems. And we just need to get, I'm not gonna say ambitious, but Next time around, we need to find some things that are more marketable and can be sold as, as uh, real wins. So, but thank you for everyone for preparing and coming and contributing because we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.